Good morning everyone and welcome to the 2017 uh, ANZAC commemorations and to our own Rhodesian dedication. We thank again Hobsonville RSA who kindly host us uh, as they have done now for some 20 years. Uh, as we do each year we start by pledging our allegiance to New Zealand, this beautiful country of ours. As we've moved through the centenary years of World War I, our commemorations have centred on uh, Gallipoli in 1915, the Somme in 1916, where we saw Kiwis, South Africans, and even small numbers of Rhodesians fighting together. In 1917, saw the start of the Allied Spring Offensive, uh, including the Battle of Champagne, the Battle of Arras, where again we saw, saw strong Kiwi contingents. The Allies then pressed on hard that year with the Flanders Offensive, the Battle of Mazines mentioned in the earlier talk, and the Third Battle of Ypres, Passchendaele, the famous Passchendaele, and the Battle of Cambrai ending in December 1917. So a tough, hard driving year for, for the Allies. To continue with our look back at those years, I'd like now to hand over to Charles Chapman, who laid the wreath for us today. Charles will talk more of World War I, but also of earlier connections to the Boer War and more recently to the Second World War and his family service in those conflicts. Briefly about Charles, he was born in Salisbury in 1953 and was six when the family moved from Salisbury to Bulawayo. After finishing at Hamilton High, he could have gone off to South Africa to university, but just decided to stay on in Rhodesia and do his national service. That was in 1972 when we know the war, war was rap rapidly escalating. A brave move when others might not have done the same and taken the easy way out. Charles was in Take 128, B Company. He attended School of Infantry and then went on to serve with one in-depth company in Wanky and then up in the Northeast. He later moved to South Africa to pursue a career in IT, returning to Zimbabwe in 1980. As with many of us who saw the writing on the wall in those early days, in 1987, the family moved on here to New Zealand. Charles, thanks for doing the honours for us today. It's a very special moment, the rang, laying of that wreath, as you know. And uh, now, could you all please give Charles a warm welcome. Um, morning, everyone. Um, as Rob said, a great honour to be able to um, lay the wreath on behalf of the association. So I thank you for that. And... Um, Thank you for, for listening to um, what I'm about to tell you. Um, I don't have any um, particular stories about um, heroism in the family um, during the World War, First World War, Second World War, but what I would like to talk about is um, the, the scale of those conflicts and how that actually affected my family. I'd like, it, like if I may, to start with my grandfather, whose medals I'm wearing today. Um, my grandfather was actually born in Adelaide in 1880 and um, he didn't get much of an education when he was um, young for various reasons um, so at the tender age of about 14, 15 he found himself working as a, a horse wrangler in the Adelaide area and when the um, second Anglo-Boer War broke out in South Africa in, in 1899 um, the British Imperial Government was obviously mustering an Imperial Army to um, prosecute the war against the Boers. Um, this army, of course, included many contingents from Australia, New Zealand, and further afield. Um, at the um, tender age of 19, Charles, like a number of us, um, volunteered for, um, for some service in the military. Um, according to the request from the British Imperial Government at the time, um, the contingent that they were putting together at this time was supposed to be a corps of seasoned bushmen, bold riders and sharpshooters capable of successfully contending with the guerrilla army. But I guess being a horse wrangler, uh, I think my grandfather was quite well suited to this. I assume he was pretty good at what he did because approximately four and a half thousand men volunteered for the fourth contingent and only 629 were accepted after a very, very rigorous selection process. Advertising for the contingent started, or stated that men between the ages of 21 and 45 were needed for the contingent. So my grandfather, like I guess a lot of people um, before him, lied about his age and um, uh, got into the, the corps. So the contingent trained in Victoria departed for South Africa on the 1st of May 1900 aboard the SS Victorian. 
Um, the contingent arrived in Byra on the 23rd of May 1900 and from Byra they were transported by train up to Amtali on the Rhodesian border. They arrived here um, and were then marched from Amtali down to Marindellis where they arrived on the 11th of July. Basically the, the contingent was divided into five squadrons, A, B, C, D and E squadrons. And from my father's war records or service records, we can deduce that he was in either A or B squadron under a Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas William Kelly. Um, a and B squadrons were soon sent from Marindellis to Bulawayo and then on to Mafeking by train, as we know the Mafeking siege was on at the time. Um, from there they were dispatched to Ottoswerp and formed part of Brigadier General Lord Errol's Brigade under Lieutenant General Sir Frederick Carrington. The remaining three squadrons remained in Rhodesia under Major Clark at Marindellis, Fort Charter, Fort Victoria, Thule and Bulawayo. Um, there they were engaged in lines of protecting the lines of communication um, until the end of the year, at which time um, they, they were also sent from Rhodesia to the Orange Free State and the Cape Colony. So by the end of the um, war, an officer and 22 other ranks from this contingent had been killed or died. 19, uh, 14 officers and nine other ranks were transferred to other units and four officers and 25 other ranks were struck off in South Africa, my grandfather being one of them. He had obviously chosen to remain in South Africa and so on the 2nd of August 1901 he was discharged from the unit that was known as the Victorian Imperial Bushmen. So earlier on that year, on the 22nd of June, the remainder of the contingent, which consisted of 17 officers and 501 other ranks, they boarded the Orient in East London and sailed home to Australia, calling in at Albany on the way home. They arrived in Melbourne on the 22nd of July 1901, were paid off and were demobilised. Shortly after being discharged from the 4th Imperial contingent, uh, my grandfather joined the Cape Police at the recommendation of the um, Imperial Contingent. Um, having left the Cape Police after a, about a year where he did sort of paramilitary uh, police work, um, he then um, started working for an engineering company which was um, involved in the supply and installation of farm equipment in general and windmills and water pumps in particular. So at the outbreak of World War I, um, Charles was living, in, um, was living in, in Kimberley and he would have been about 35 years of age. I guess um, that it, he would have been considered too old for active service on the front lines. So he, he had volunteered uh, to join the Veterans Reserve, Veterans Reserve in Kimberley. Not much going on in the Veterans Reserve. So he soon transferred to a unit called the Cape Auxiliary Horse Transport Companies, which was to see him being shipped off to France for the remainder of the war and beyond. Now the Cape Auxiliary Horse Transport Unit was formed in 1916 for the collection, training and forwarding of personnel to the, the war effort. It consisted of about eight companies numbering roughly 6,500 coloured uh, people from the Cape who served as drivers with the Army uh, services Corps in northern France. Um, my grandfather's war records show that um, once he arrived in, in Le Havre in, the UK, in France, uh, he occasionally wandered over to um, Britain on leave. And um, on one of those occasions, um, he actually married my grandmother, Olive Blanche Goss, who was living in uh, Devon at the time. There's a bit of a story behind how she came to be there, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. Um, but Charles finally left France um, in October, November 1919, um, having done his work as uh, in the area of, of um, repatriating South African troops and equipment back to South Africa. When he and his wife returned to South Africa, they, they returned to Kimberley, um, and it wasn't too long after that that my, my father was born in Kimberley in 1921.
at the outbreak of the um, Second World War, uh, my father, who was um, 18 years and seven months of age at the time, um, reportedly got um, his father drunk so that he would actually persuade him to sign the, his release papers so that the father could volunteer and uh, go off to war. Um, I, I understand that the legal age at that time for people was 21 years of age, not, not 18 as it is now, which is why he needed his father's permission to uh, volunteer. So my father eventually um, uh, joined the um, joined a, the second Transvaal Scots reg Regiment, known as the Transvaal Jocks, and um, as you know, they, or may know, they, they were part of the 6th um, Brigade um, that went up to North Africa and was unfortunately captured uh, at Tobruk um, by Rommel, along with 35,000 other troops. In the meantime, my, my grandfather was um, obviously um, not going to be outdone, so a couple of months later, at the age of 59 years and 11 months, uh, he again volunteered for military service. So in October 1940, he completed his service and he was posted to an internment camp in Coffeefontein, which is about 100 kilometers southwest of Bloemfontein. Um, here, a large uh, es establishment um, holding about 2,000 Italian prisoners of war had been established, and some German prisoners of war as well. But interestingly enough, there were also about 800 uh, South African internees in this camp. Um, these were the guys who were suspected of being pro-Nazi. Uh, hence they ended up in this internment camp. Uh, among the South Africans, uh, interestingly enough, was a chap by the name of Francois Christian Erasmus, FC Erasmus, who some of you might know um, became the South African National, uh, National Party politician, Minister of Defence from 1948 to 1959, as well as Minister of Justice from 1959 to 1961. And another important chap in this camp at the time was a chap by the name of B.J. Foster, who many of you will know uh, became the Prime Minister of South Africa in 66 and later President of South Africa from 78 to 79. Okay. So Charles was due be, to be discharged from the army on the 1st of July 1943, but um, his army records show that either he or the army or both um, elected to extend his service and so for another six months he remained in service and by the time he was finally discharged from the Union Defence Force on the 31st of January 1944 having passed the age limit for active service um, he'd served another three and a half years in the um, in the South African Defence Force and he was 63 years and four months old at the time of his discharge so he'd given it a fair go um, as I said, he met and married my grandmother on one of his leave trips in, um, in Devon, in England, in 1919. The, the story about how she came to be there is, um, I think, quite interesting. It actually starts with her father, my great-grandfather, who actually was a bootmaker who hailed from uh, the Cornwall area of England. Now, you probably know life in England in the late 19th century was pretty tough. And so my great-grandfather probably spotted an opportunity to go and make a lucrative living for himself making boots for the um, British Army in South Africa because bootmaker was his trade. And so he made his own way to South Africa and um, at the age of about 40 years enlisted in the um, British Army in South Africa. Um, he left behind in England his wife and six children ranging in age from 13 to 4 years of age. Um, at the end of the war, he obviously sent for or went and fetched his family and brought them out to South Africa because he, like my grandfather, decided that South Africa would be a great place to stay and um, bring up the family. Um, the family was obviously um, homesick and occasionally did trips back to England. Um, on one occasion, uh, my great-grandmother and four of her children, including my uh, grandmother, visited England and that was around about um, 1918. So as the war was winding down towards the end of 1980 the family decided it was time to return to South Africa and I'll just get my dates right. So 
So, um, around about September 1918, the family boarded a ship which was called the SS Rhodesia, um, which was bound for, for South Africa. Now, the SS Rhodesia was actually a pseudonym for a ship called the SS Galway Castle. Apparently it was um, quite a common thing to do in those days was to rename ships or give them false names so that would sort of confuse the enemy as to whether or not they should actually attack these ships. So the ship set sail for South Africa from Southampton um, early in September 1918. About 300 miles um, south, south west um, of Land's End, the ship was actually attacked by a German submarine. U-boat um, 82 lined up the ship and torpedoed it. Um, a single torpedo was fired, struck the ship amidships. Uh, the, the explosion was so intense that it broke the back of the ship. Uh, the ship sagged in the middle and the stem and the stern raised out of the water. And that, the devastation of that explosion uh, disabled all communications apparently on the ship. So. Aboard the ship there were about 143 um, crew, about 350 walking wounded South Africans, soldiers returning to South Africa, and about 450 um, passengers, a total of about 950 people. So the U-boat looked like it was um, lining up um, to take another shot at the ship, but the devastation from the first torpedo was such that I believe the the commander probably thought that it wasn't worth wasting another torpedo on the ship because it was going to go down. Um, miraculously, the ship didn't go down. And miraculously, within one hour, um, everybody had been evacuated off the, the ship, um, including um, my family. Um, so my great-grandmother, -grand, great my grandmother, and her sister and brother um, managed to survive um, that episode. The ship was towed back um, towards uh, Southampton, but unfortunately three, three days later it, it eventually sank. Um, approximately 150 people died in that incident, which was quite miraculous given the devastation of the attack on the cruise liner. So my grandmother ended up back in um, Devon, and that is where she met my grandfather, and they subsequently got married. And after the war in 1919, my grandfather brought them back out uh, to South Africa. So, had it not been for that, um, that terrible incident, um, I probably wouldn't have been here because my father wouldn't have been here and so on. And just finally, uh, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about um, some relatives that I discovered that we had here in New Zealand. Um, before my great-grandfather made his way to South Africa to, to join the British troops in, in uh, fighting the Boer War, um, a couple of his brothers and three of his sisters had made their way out to New Zealand. The brothers had settled in the Christchurch area and the girls had all settled in the New Plymouth, um, New Plymouth uh, Palmerston North, Wellington area. Um, when the First World War broke out, Great Uncle William was about 47 years of age. Now, in 1916, the number of volunteers that were volunteering for service overseas from New Zealand was kind of dwindling. And so the government started talking about um, conscription. And in terms of that conscription, any man over the age of 21 and under the age of 46 was likely or was liable for conscription. Sorry, any Pakiha, strangely enough, any Pakiha. And so um, my great uncle William probably thought he was going to miss out. And so like, we've all heard stories about um, men lying about their age, saying they're a lot older in order to get into an army or a service and go and do service and so on. Haven't heard too many stories about uh, an old fella um, lying about his age, saying he was younger so that he could actually get into the service. But that's exactly what um, grand uncle William did. He lied about his age, he told them he was 45 years of age, not 47, and so he uh, managed to get into the, into the New Zealand Defence Force. So he did his training in Trentham, he was assigned to um, 2nd Battalion Canterbury Regiment, and they were shipped off to, um, to France in, in 1916. 
Unfortunately, William didn't last too long. Um, within six months, he'd been admitted to um, uh, let's get this Rumu Hospital, and he died a couple of days later, uh, ostensibly from bronchitis. Might have been a euphemism for gassing, but um, he died six months later. Uh, sorry, a few days later. And the final part of the the sort of story is that William's sister, younger sister Ellen. Um, who was living in Wellington, had met and married an Australian fellow by the name of um, Elijah John Carey. And he was another chap who volunteered for service in 1916, and he was aged 39 at the time. Um, I like to think of them as, as sort of kindly folks because they'd actually adopted um, his niece, um, whose parents had died back in Australia. And so and um, these, these, uh, this couple took the niece in. Um, Elijah volunteered for service and was also sent off um, to France um, in the middle of 1916. So on the 27th of May 1916, um, he set off for, for his adventure. Again, very sadly, within um, six months of, of arriving in France, um, he was wounded severely enough to die of those wounds and so very sadly for um, his wife Ellen um, she lost a, a husband and about five weeks later she lost her younger brother so there you go um, just uh, I hope that kind of illustrates the, the, the sort of scale of the First World War the fact that it affected people um, literally from all over the world and I think my family stories are probably just, you know, a few of millions and millions of stories um, like this. And so, um, yeah, that, that's really all I had to tell you about them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I will go through the commemorations and um, I start with the, um, the opportunity we take each year to remember the sick and those who still carry the scars of war and of course some have passed on since we last met here. I'll read the role of those who passed on. There will be others that we don't know of of course. And the first name I'd like to mention is Eileen Hartman. Eileen was a stalwart of this association and sadly passed away at the end of January this year. Some may not know this, but Eileen was a world champion practical pistol shooter, taking the overall gold medal in the IPSC World Championships held in Rhodesia in 1977. Danny was in the, in the men's team, but uh, Eileen won the, won the gold for the ladies' team. So our thoughts go out to Danny and, hi, and his family. The other names I have are Major Joe Rowland, Rhodesia Regiment, RSM John McCallan, and we understand RLI, Brian Vaughan, Rhodesian Air Force and then BSAP. Frick Kloppers, BSAP reservist, a well-known uh, member of the Marindellis community. David Joubert, Grey Scouts and Chapinga Patu Mounted Unit. Bill Webster, I don't have Bill's uh, details I'm afraid. And Major Rodney Fuller, who was a dentist in the Rhodesia Army Medical Corps. And our sympathies go out to all those families and those that we don't know of who passed on. I'll turn now to our commemoration to our fallen. I was fortunate to visit Vietnam a couple of months back and a large part of my trip was focused on the Vietnam War, of course. As well as around 58,000 Americans killed, there were between 690,000 and 3.8 million Vietnamese people killed. I got the view from the guides that the vast majority of Vietnam's people just want to put this behind them and indeed they have moved on. There are the battle, famous battle sites, of course, but as the jungle takes them back and generations move on, it is increasingly becoming a war forgotten. There were two important stops for me. Firstly, the 1ATF Australian Task Force Base at Nui Dat, southeast of Saigon, where most of the Kiwi contingent was based. Just nearby, along to the famous Long Tan Memorial, where we took time to reflect on the 19, 1966 battle where over 2,000 combined Viet Cong and North, Vietnam, North Vietnamese Army NBA 
forces took on just over 100 Australians, with the Kiwis heavily becoming heavily involved with their artillery too. 18 men died, but an estimated 5 to 800 VC and VA were killed. The Anzacs had won that fierce battle. A few days later, we found ourselves further north of the famous Kaysan, which in 1967, reaching its peak in 1968, the Battle of Kaysan saw two divisions, no less than two divisions, take on the base. Almost totally cut off by road, the Americans, like the Aussies at Long Tan, pers persevered and won that battle. In this case, with massive air support, uh, resupply and counter-attack. Uh, go on YouTube if you haven't already and have a look at it, it's quite a punch up. The NDV, NBA divisions of, um, were totally decimated and, and driven off finally. At both places you would not imagine that these had been sites of such fierce battles. The memorial at Long Tan is almost lost in the rubber plantations. At Kaysan, a small museum, the airstrip, even a Huey and a Hercules standing there, but all are gradually weathering away and being taken back by the bush. As the generation that fought there moves on, and visitor numbers inevitably dwindle, like Long Tan, Kaysan, I fear, will virtually disappear forgotten. And maybe that's how some would have wanted it, an unpopular war in the eyes of many back in their home countries to the point where people scorned their returning soldiers and, in what can only be described as an awkward pause of several years, even refused to acknowledge those who died. Standing at Kaysan under those menacing ranges, I felt such strong parallels to own Bush War. It could have been the Zambezi escarpment above me as I stood down on the valley floor. It too was unpopular, not at home but with our own people, but in world eyes, an inconvenience to the West as decolonization tripped over itself in its race down through Africa. Like Vietnam, many, many battles were well and truly won by our people, and the war did not end in military defeat, but at bargaining tables thousands of miles away. And by nature of the deal, for those of us remaining to op openly honor your fallen could have brought you trouble. So in wars like this, where opinion is against them, it is even easier to forget those who went off, fought hard, fought tenaciously, fought brilliantly, with good humor and spirit, won the battles, but never came home from the war. They, f they fly forgotten as a dream in, a, in the, the hymn today, they fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. So in wars like this, where opinion is against them, it's easy to, it's, it's even easier to forget those who went off and fought but never returned home. We are very fortunate to be standing here today and doing quite the opposite, remembering them. To close now, the poetry I've chosen uh, is out of Vietnam, and it's called Silent Homecoming 1965 by Richard McGinty. My shining shoes echoed hollowed sounds as I walked home towards that sacred ground, where childhoods were spent in laughter and sun, that time that was long before I'd learned to shoot a gun. For me, no bands or crowds came to greet as I left the bus and found the street. I did notice that faces turned, looked away, from this uniform all pressed with medals displayed. A small town where no one said, hello. A small town where there was no one I didn't know. Now in retrospect, this greeting seems like cheers compared to comrades returning to their homes the next 10 years. What he's saying is he got silence and stares when he got home, but as the war became more and more unpopular, soldiers who followed him home, alive and dead, of course, were treated